started. Um, I'll pretend not to be jealous of the fact that there are more people here for the seminar than there were at mine. Um, I'll just gloss over that. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Richard Brown, who is from the Centre for Future Air and Space Transportation here at Strathclyde, and he's going to provide well, just a vision of what the future and his research. So that will just pass you over to Richard. Thank you, Malcolm. And thanks, everybody, for coming. It's an amazing turnout. <laughs> right. We all know that air transport, since the Second World War, has changed the way we think about the world. It's made us a much smaller place. It's allowed us to go places we've never been able to go before. It's put things into our shops that we've never been able to see before. But we also know that with the system as it is, there are problems. If we go to the airports, it seems day by day there are more cancellations and delays. There are more problems in terms of passengers and uh, not being able to get on the aircraft and so on. And what I'd like to propose today is that there are systematic reasons for that. But more importantly, what I'd like to do is pr to propose a future, a different future, where some of these problems might be alleviated by a very different mode of airline transport. So what I'd like to do today, first of all, is talk a little bit about the current state of air transport and why we are where we are. What I'll then do and spend most of the talk doing is talk about a vision for the future. First of all, where do we want to go? Then how will we actually get there? Then what the future airliner will look like? So in other words, taking a slightly more technical view of what the future might look like. And then I will labor the point and I will talk at length about what we still need to do to realize this vision. So I think it is fair to say that presently the air transport system is moving towards crisis. And the reason for that is that there are too many aircraft in the sky simply for too long. And that is having two fundamental effects. First of all, it's causing fundamental damage to the environment, both in terms of pollution, especially particulate load within the atmosphere, and secondly, in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas that has been generated and distributed within our planetary system. On the other side, air traffic management is struggling to cope with the number of aircraft movements per day. And this is the fundamental systemic reason for the delays and cancellations which we experience at the moment. And of course, delay within the air traffic management system leads to added pollution and, in the long run, detracts from the safety of the system that we would like to treat at a very fundamental commuter-like way. So let's go into some more of those details. Let's talk about the current state of air transport. And let's first have a look at global pollution. These are two very interesting sets of graphs from a very recent paper, in fact published in 2010, which at the top shows the distribution of fuel burn within the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see the concentration within certain regions of the Earth's atmosphere. The diagrams at left over here for the entire mission, in other words from takeoff to landing, the diagrams at right here focus on the emissions during the landing and takeoff phases of the mission. And you can see that the landing and takeoff emissions are concentrated around the major population centers of the world. So much for the top graphs over there, which show the fuel burn. These graphs over here show, first of all, the particulate load due to black carbon, and secondly, due to smaller particulate uh, products of the combustion within the aircraft engines. Now, you can see that there's a concentration where you'd expect there to be. But the interesting thing are these large bands of concentration which are well away from the regions in which the pollution was originally emitted. And we need to understand that. In both of these diagrams, you can see that that's precisely the case. Now, what is the point of these diagrams? Well, to a certain extent, as I remark here, the cause-effect relationship on the environment of these pollutants is still poorly understood. It's expected that the contribution to greenhouse effect from aviation is about 3% of the world total. And the number of premature deaths due to pollution is probably about 1%, probably about 1 can be attributed to current civil aviation. But the following graph becomes a little bit more interesting because what it shows is the pollutant load within the Earth's atmosphere segregated by source. So the top diagram over here shows you where the pollutants go that come from operations which are solely based in Europe. The second diagram over here shows you the black carbon distribution which comes about through operations within the United States. And the third diagram over here shows a similar diagram for Southeast Asia. And what you will see, this diagram is particularly, it's particularly apparent in that diagram, is that although most of the source is within the United States, there's a significant transport within the Earth's atmosphere that ends up polluting very widely distributed other parts of the globe. So 
The problem is not a local one, it's a global one. If we confine operations to one part of the globe, we end up distributing that pollutant load across the world. Can we do something about that? Is it fair? The second point that I want to bring up is the state of, globe, of, of the air traffic control system and global congestion. The system is reaching overload, I think it is fair to say. If we have a look at the situation presently, this is the number of flights uh, per day as a density map over Europe presently, or in 2006. And this is the projected scenario for 2025, so 20 years in the future from the original measurements. This area over here is more than 200 flights per day. You can see how that area is planning on expanding. This diagram over here shows you how the controller workload rating increases with the number of flights per day. And you can see that there's almost a linear increase. And essentially what that means is if we are to keep up with this growth in traffic, then the uh, number of air traffic controllers has to grow in step with that kind of expansion. And this is just not going to happen. So is there an alternative way of approaching the problem? And what I believe is that the problems that are inherent in the system at the moment can be addressed by de developing an integrated transport system, which uses ground and air transport together. So in other words, we clear the skies of unnecessary traffic, we replace some of the commuter travel, which clogs up the skies, with high-speed green rail, and we use the rail to allow dedicated displaced hubs for long-range travel. But then what we do is we go to the long-range travel, we make fundamental changes just there. We fundamentally revise how we go about long-range air transport. The first thing we do is we improve productivity and the reliability of the service, and the second thing we do is we reduce environmental impact. And the way we do that is technological. Now, speed and altitude turn out to be the key. Now, this is not a new, new idea by any means. It's a very old one. In fact, Frank Whittle, the inventor of the jet engine, in his thesis in 1928, wrote precisely about the effects of speed and altitude on the future of the air traffic economy. But what we need to do is we need to see Frank Whittle's ideas in a somewhat more modern context. And this is essentially what we're talking about. If we focus only on long-range international air transport, then speed is important for the following reasons. First of all, the productivity of current aircraft is just too low for the system. In other words, what we do is we solve the problem presently of huge numbers of people trying to get from A to B using volume. We increase the number of aircraft to accommodate the people. Yet what we could do is we could change that. If we increase the speed of the aircraft, what we could then do is we could use frequency instead of volume to address that very same problem. So what I'm saying is that productivity is at the source of the congestion problem. If we up the speed, what we can do is we can improve the situation as far as congestion is concerned. Secondly, the time interval between takeoff and landing for long-range flights is simply too long at the moment. The idea that you take off from Florida and end up in the United Kingdom seven or eight hours later is the source of the delay problem. Conditions change at the arrival airport. Yet these aircraft arriving short of fuel have to be accommodated as a priority within the system. And hence there's a knock-on effect into the commuter uh, lines and that is where the delay quite often within the commuter system appears. Now it turns out speed one thing, altitude the next. Altitude, as I'll show you, will turn out to be the key to the pollution problem and also it will be necessary to allow speed for basic aerodynamic fundamental reasons. Okay, so where do we start? Let's talk about speed. Speed, time saved, productivity increased. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about ranges in terms of this fundamental range here, which I'll call the global range, which if you like is the distance halfway around the world. It's about 20,000 kilometers. So if I express various routes in terms of the global range, London to Moscow is about 0.12 of the global range. London to Sydney is about 0.85 times the global range. Then what we need to do is we need to decide how fast we're going to get from A to B or how long it's going to take us to get from A to B. And this diagram illustrates that. So the travel time is on the bottom axis over here in hours and the distance we want to travel is a fraction of the global range is on the vertical axis. And these various red lines over here indicate the speed that we would have to travel. Well, those are lines of constant speed. So let's say we want to travel from London to Los Angeles in two hours. You can see we sit here which is at a speed of about 3,000 kilometers an hour. If we wanted to travel from London to New York, we're sitting somewhere over here, and there's the Concorde, sitting at a speed of 
roughly 2,000 kilometers an hour. Okay, so let's say we want to travel these various ranges within a period of around about two hours, the magic London to Sydney in two hours, which is talked about so often these days. Then what you can see is that the design space in which we have to develop the aircraft that we want to perform that mission is fairly large. The global range extends from about 0.4 to about 0.9, and somehow we need an aircraft which is capable of all those ranges. Now that's generally not achievable. It's not sensible to do that within a single aircraft. But the problem with this analysis here is that it's fairly naive. What these ranges assume is a crow's flight trajectory, a great circle route. And if we take in the real world, then the situation changes ever so slightly. In that, speed comes at a disadvantage. And the major disadvantage is noise, particularly the sonic boom. Now, in the past and in the present, the sonic boom will pro provide a very strong constraint on the allowable routes for high-speed flight. So even if we wanted to travel at about 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 kilometers an hour, we would find ourselves being constrained to specific routes around the globe. For example, provision, uh, the, the, there currently exists a prohibition on supersonic overflight over certain countries, the United States being one of them. And that was the downfall of the Concorde, of course, in the U.S. supersonic transport aircraft. Now, for supersonic aircraft, boom is a problem throughout the mission. Whereas for hypersonic aircraft, boom could be a problem through parts of the mission, but is most acute during the acceleration and deceleration phases at landing and takeoff. Okay, so what this does is it imposes a constraint on the routes that our aircraft could actually follow. So this is what real trajectories look like. This is the naive great circle routing, in this case between Scotland, let's say, and Los Angeles. But there are two possible scenarios which are altogether more realistic. The one is that the routing would have to be sensitive to overflying certain parts of the globe. So that's an example route, perhaps, that one might fly if you were not permitted to fly supersonically over the United States and were not allowed to fly into the polar regions for reasons of, of uh, environmentalism. One potential scenario. The other potential scenario is that arrival and departure at certain airports would be constrained to certain corridors. In other words, if you have an aircraft which is traveling very quickly, you would have to come down a specific path to prevent the sonic boom spreading laterally and disturbing people off the designated routes. So that might impose, for example here, this is a northern corridor that might, for example, be mandated. And this might be a seawards corridor that's mandated for these aircraft to leave Los Angeles. And you can see how that would impose a trajectory on the vehicle, which was very, very different from the great circle routing that I've drawn over there. Now, is this a disadvantage? Well, in a way, it plays for us. Because what it means is that all the routes that we want to fly, when you start to take realistic trajectories into account, are all roughly the length of the global range. It's much easier to find a direct trajectory the further apart the two end, well, the beginning and end points are. And as you bring those points closer, what you find is that your trajectories become longer and longer, less efficient, and they all tend to cluster around the global range. What that means in terms of our speed diagram is that the design space starts to cluster up here around the global range. And we end up looking at an aircraft which if we want to get over that global range in roughly two hours, we're starting to talk about an aircraft which has to travel at 10,000 kilometers an hour and has to have a range between 0.8 and 0.1 of the global range. So a much smaller design space makes our design job a lot easier to achieve. Let's talk about altitude. We've talked about speed, and what I've said is that to gain that speed advantage, we need to go high. Well, there are other reasons as well. The first is environmentalism. And the idea is we can't continue to use the jet stream. Now, what is the jet stream? Well, there's the planet, and we know that there are these global circulations which are there to transport energy from the equator to the poles. And the Earth splits up into a number, of, its atmosphere splits up into a number of rotating cells. And along the borders of each of those cells are these strong currents. Now, the advantage of flying along the jet streams is huge because you're flying with the current behind you, if you like. And you can save hours on transit from, let's say, from uh, Washington to London by flying in the jet stream. The problem is that if you look more closely at the structure of the fluid dynamics within those cells, you're flying in a very dangerous part of the atmosphere. Here is the jet stream sitting at about uh, uh, eight kilometers just that part of the atmosphere in which aircraft like 747s fly, and those jet streams are at the edges of the two rotational cells. Now, first of all, 
the flow within the jet stream is very good at transporting pollutants across the atmosphere. And that's the region, reason for that broad band of pollutant that I showed you in the earlier diagram. The second thing, though, is that this downwards flow is very efficient at taking the pollutants out of the atmosphere and depositing them on the ground below the aircraft trajectory. So the idea of flying in the jet stream should, is, it should become a slightly old-fashioned one. The second thing is, if we want to go up in altitude, we need to be careful. The problem is ozone. And if we look at this part of the atmosphere from about 10 kilometers up to 40 kilometers, we find that is where the major concentration of ozone happens to be. 747s, conventional passenger aircraft as we know them right now, don't have much effect on ozone because they fly too low. Concorde was thought to have a fairly significant effect on ozone. Aircraft like the SR-71, an even greater effect. So what we need to do is we need to be careful when we decide which altitude we're going to fly that we don't fly within this critical band of the atmosphere where the major atmospheric ozone concentration happens to be. So the idea is that maybe the future airliner should fly even higher. Now, why? Let's go into a bit more of the physics. If we look at the atmosphere, the atmosphere has a rather interesting temperature profile. This is what the temperature looks like. So at the ground, we're talking roughly 20 degrees, sudden decrease, and then this fairly complex variation as we increase with altitude. If we convert that into a Mach number versus altitude diagram, then we find that there's a rather interesting niche just at the top of the stratosphere where the Mach number is much the same as it would be at sea level. We have a pocket where the Mach number that we'd have to fly at is a lot lower than if we were to go higher or if we were to go lower in altitude. The second thing is that as we tend to go higher, the density of the atmosphere reduces dramatically. Now in terms of airframe drag, that's very useful in that we can exploit this reduction in drag for a given power, pl power, power, pl power plant. The problem, of course, is that engine performance also deteriorates as we go up. So somewhere within this diagram of altitude, we reach a balance. And coincidentally, it turns out that if we look at engine performance and airframe drag together, and we look at this Mach number pocket, then round about an altitude of 50 or 60 kilometers starts to look about right for these very high-speed aircraft. Compare that to the 10 kilometers or so at which a 747 flies currently. Okay, some more properties of the atmosphere. The atmosphere above 50 kilometers has some rather strange properties that we might be able to exploit. The first thing is that the mean free path between uh, individual gas molecules starts to grow very quickly. Now what that means is if we're traveling at very high speed in an aircraft which is traveling supersonically or hypersonically and producing shocks, then we're sitting in this transition regime between continuum and molecular dynamics where the shocks tend to be spread out. They're quite fat structures compared to what they would be at lower altitudes. And there's a chance that if we're careful there, we might be able to lessen sonic boom using that particular effect. Okay, one needs to be careful, shockwaves focus, and we need to understand a little bit more about how shockwaves are formed in these rarefied atmospheres. There are other problems though, density turbulence. It's not clear whether there aren't pockets of high density intermixed with low at these altitudes. And what, how do aircraft behave when they fly through those particular types of patchiness within the upper atmosphere. The SR-71, for example, was a clear, clear case where density turbulence had a particularly interesting effect. The other important thing, though, is that as we go up in altitude, the viscosity of the air, the kinematic viscosity, increases considerably. And what that means is that the flow can become laminar over much larger parts of the vehicle than it would at lower altitude. And this diagram over here is a really, really interesting one because what it shows is that thermal image of the space shuttle on re-entry. Nine times the speed of sound and at about 49 kilometers altitude, so just in the band that we're interested in. And these blue patches here are fairly cool patches. And the reason why most of the underside of the space shuttle is cool under those flight conditions is because the flow is naturally laminar, so the heat transfer to the vehicle is reduced. You can see this broad patch over here of high temperature, and that's caused by the boundary layer changing from being laminar to being turbulent. And that is as a result of a damaged tile sitting up here on the front end of the space shuttle under those conditions. So can we exploit la natural laminar flow once we get to these altitudes? And I think the answer is yes. And we can use that to reduce dramatically the heating rates and the drag. And secondly, we can perhaps, uh, well, if we have this transition between laminar and turbulent flow, then we might need some advanced control to, uh, devices to, to keep things going smoothly. But certainly we're sitting at a very interesting and important part of the atmosphere if we go up to 50 kilometers. And now this really gets, pushes the boundaries of science. 
at high altitude, we start to encounter real gas effects if we go fast enough. At the design speed, at this 10,000 kilometers an hour, the air is actually chemically reactive. We end up with vibrational excitation of both the oxygen and the nitrogen, and if we go up in speed a little bit more, we start to look at oxygen dissociation. So chemical reactions taking place in the fluid around the, the vehicle. Now, we don't understand very much about those effects. Long-term exposure to such an environment, we might need to mitigate against. We might need to control the effects. For example, surface contamination and de degradation by reactive compounds sitting on the surface. But on the other hand, can we exploit the physics? Can we use the fact that the molecules are excited for really interesting possibilities like drag reduction, flow control, aircraft dynamic control even, or perhaps even to design a new type of propulsion system which can use these already partially dissociated uh, at, uh, molecules to, to achieve some advantage. Now, okay, a lot of pie in the sky, a lot of perhaps and if and what we might be able to use. Let's have a look at history and see just where we are in our progress towards such a vehicle. Now, what we want to do is we want to sit out here. So we're talking about 10,000 kilometers an hour at an altitude of 50 to 70 kilometers. And here in white are aircraft that have already been constructed. So the 747, the Concorde, and this SR-71, for example. And you can see that they all live down in this bottom part of the diagram. Current projects in blue, well, that was a 1960s project, in fact, the Boeing SST. The European LAPCAT project is looking at a number of, or two different vehicles scattered along that curve, and there's the Sanger program, which was conducted by MBB in the 1980s. Nowhere near, if you like, our future airliner at the moment. But what I want to draw your attention to are the three red dots on that diagram, which are experimental aircraft. They're pointers. They show us the way. The X-15 from the 1960s and 1970s, which showed us just how high you can actually get an aircraft to fly. The X-51, and in particular the X-43, which I purposely draw right off the scale on this particular graph here, which show us just how fast we can actually go. Okay, so we have work to do. The holy grail technologies that have been pursued for so many decades in the past, first of all in terms of air transport, the hypersonic Mach 8 to 10 airliner, which could fly from New York around the globe within two hours. Ronald Reagan's Orient Express. Project started 1986, killed off in 1995. In space, the single stage to orbit reusable rocket, in this case the X-33, again, a lot of activity, officially terminated in 2001. But both these programs yielded technologies which are useful and which have shown, well, in recent years, somewhat of a renaissance. So the X-43A in 19, sorry, 2004 flew at Mach 9.8, 100,000 feet. Okay, it only worked for 10 seconds, but, and 10 seconds is a long way from the 10,000 seconds that we require, but there are pointers. The technology is getting there. So I think there is reason for cautious optimism. Now let's go back into history a little bit more and try and understand why we are not where we expect to be. And the reason for that is that the key technologies that we require for these sorts of aircraft are still very immature. At least those that allow evolutionary development, should we say, expansion from what we already know. And I'd like to focus on propulsion, and I'd like to focus on materials and aerothermodynamics. Now I'll pose the question, do we need a revolution in technology? So here's the problem with propulsion. Mach number on the horizontal axis, specific impulse, which is a measure of the efficiency of the engine in a way, how much fuel you need to burn to gain a certain amount of thrust on the vertical axis over there. And you can see I've marked off various types of technology. The turbojet followed by the ramjet followed by the scramjet. This is where we want to sit. And the problem here is that no one technology spans the gap all the way from Mach 0 sitting on the end of the runway up to the kind of Mach 10 or beyond that we really want to apply the technology. So we end up with these various technologies which fall flat at a certain Mach number and we have to then change to a different technology. No one engine spans the gap and gets us to where we want to go. In terms of materials, here's Mach number again. and Here's the specific strength of the material. And here are various common materials used in high-speed aviation. So graphite materials, titanium. Over here we have carbon-carbon, which is a bit of an outlier. And here we have the various nickel alloys which are used in high-speed uh, aircraft in the past. And all of them turn into spaghetti, limp spaghetti, by the time you get up to a Mach number of six. 
Okay, you can save those materials a little bit by conditioning the aerodynamics. So for example, if you use ablative materials or condition the, the, the boundary layer in some way, you can extend that Mach number boundary out to about six to eight. Now, the problem is we want to put our future airliner out at Mach 10. So you can see that both in terms of uh, technology of propulsion and technology of aerodynamics and thermodynamics, we are some way off where we need to be. <coughs> so the question then is where do we start? Well, hard experience shows us that the technology is not just around the corner. And we need to put in the dedicated long-term planning and research to sort out some of these issues, to address these issues, principally in terms of aerodynamic heating and materials, in terms of propulsion, and also, as I'll describe in some detail, human physiology and air traffic management. And if there is to be a revolution, well, then certainly we'll need some hard work to achieve it. Okay, so let's have a look at these two enablers in slightly more detail. First of all, the pr propulsion idea. So that's where we want to be. And we have the example of the X43A to guide us. The problem, as I said, is the X43 flew for 7.6 seconds. So the technology is not quite as developed as we might want to do. And the problem here is different technologies needed for different Mach number ranges. So one solution <coughs> borrowed from Jerry Anderson is to have an aircraft which has ramjets. Well, let's start from the beginning, which has turbojets, which work at low Mach number. Then it turns over to ramjets at a slightly higher Mach number, and then rocket pods at the very highest speeds. I couldn't find scramjets in that particular design, but I'm sure they're there somewhere. <coughs> Now that design has been proposed. This is a supposedly a plausible solution to the problem. But you can see the problem. You're, you're taking along dead, dead uh, pieces of technology with you. Parts of the aircraft which only work at certain parts of the, the flight envelope and then you switch them off and leave them just to have their added mass in your aircraft as you carry on further. So really that's not a practical idea. But what is a practical idea is a completely different way of looking at engines. In other words, the whole idea of hybrid engines. And work is beginning on this technology. If you go down to reaction engines in Bristol, no, not in Bristol, in Oxford, they're actually working on developing some of these concepts for an engine which actually spans the Mach number range. So it gives us performance which allows us to fly with the same engines all the way from Mach zero up to the kinds of Mach numbers that we want to. And this is the kind of design that you would think of. You can see it doesn't look anything like a conventional gas turbine engine. It has intercoolers and precoolers and rocket nozzles, and bypasses, and ramjets, and all this sort of thing, but it's a very different way of looking at the technology of engines. And maybe this is the way that we can end up achieving the kind of propulsion system that we require for the future aircraft. If we look at the materials problem, I think it's a lot more difficult. The problem is that it's very little, well, there's very little chance, I think, that fundamentally new materials will be found. I hope I'm proved wrong. I hope things like carbon technology comes on in leaps and bounds and we find that we have ultra-strong uh, sheets of carbon which we can build all sorts of things out of. I think the solution as far as materials is more likely to be aerodynamic. And what we're really interested here in is integrity of the material structure of the aircraft under sustained heating. So not just for 10 seconds, but for 100,000 se or 10,000 seconds to get us from here to Sydney. And the two solutions which seem to be providing the, the best possible alternatives are first of all boundary layer control using some form of blowing if we look slightly further into the future perhaps magnetohydrodynamics but perhaps most likely active structural cooling where we for example take the fuel and we duct it through the structure and use the fuel the cold fuel to cool down the structures of the material but how do we then reject the heat to the surroundings there are many problems with embodying this particular technology and this is a, a, a kind of example. You can see what, what's happening here. We'd have a double-layered skin, and within that double-layered skin, there'd be these various tubes here through which, for example, we could take the liquid hydrogen, which we use to power the vehicle, and use that fluid to conduct heat away from the surface of the, of the, of the craft. But what we really need to do is we need to take this curve over here, which denotes the current limitation of technology as far as materials and structures are concerned, and we need to push that really a long way across to end up uh, with a technology which will make these future craft anything near realistic. Okay, let's change tack a little bit. Let's start talking about real engineering and how we might go about designing the future engineer. Design offices don't look like that much anymore, but I thought it was a nice picture to include. So how do we design an aircraft? 
Well, first of all, what we do is we change the way that we look at the, at the, the atmospheric variables. Here's altitude over there, and here's Mach number, and what I've drawn on here are the various curves for time taken to cover a certain distance. So this is the curve here which corresponds to our two hours to cover the global range. Right, and those curves are obtained merely from mapping the altitude Mach number curve across onto, onto there through the temperature variation. Then what we can do is we can impose an environmental limit. We can say, okay, if we want to avoid the ozone layer and contaminating the jet stream, then we need to fly above that particular curve over there. Then what we can do is we can impose a materials limit as a result of heating, and that gives us an upper bound on the Mach number that we can fly at, which remains more or less constant as we increase the altitude in that part of the atmosphere. Then what we can do is we can impose the engine performance limit. And we realize that if we can embody these hybrid engines, then we end up with an engine which can work across a wide range of Mach numbers, but the performance of which still falls off, of course, as we start to increase Mach numbers. And here we sit with a decently defined design space in which we can place our aircraft, limited in terms of altitude and limited in terms of Mach number. And that gives us a point to start our aerodynamic design. So there would be the future airliner, and those two points over here are put there specifically to remind you that the future technology uh, is a long way off our current experience. Now, getting down to nuts and bolts, what we then need to do is take that design and turn it into an actual aircraft. And no better way to do that than to try to compute the range through the very well-known Breguet range equation, which incorporates certain specific design aspects of the aircraft. So here's the propulsive efficiency of the aircraft expressed in terms of the specific impulse. Here's the aerodynamic efficiency. Here's the structural efficiency. And here's this additional term, if we travel fast enough, which is very interesting and not fully explored yet, which is the augmentation to the range that we can achieve by traveling at a significant fraction of the Earth's escape velocity. But you can see that we end up with our best design if all these terms are balanced so that we can end up with the range that we expect with the best propulsion and efficiency balanced up against all these other terms over there. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Back in the 1970s, Kuchemann did a study where he suggested that you could take the Breguet range equation and you could turn it into a map like this of actual aircraft design. What he had on the horizontal axis here is the flight Mach number. What he had on the vertical axis over there is the aircraft slenderness ratio. So in other words, how long the aircraft to what, the ratio of how long the aircraft was to what its wingspan should be. And what he found is that he could partition, partition that, that diagram into three different areas. Here's Mach 1. So all aircraft below that are super, or subsonic, and those are the kind of uh, swept wing type aircraft, the kind of conventional 747s that we're used to. Here's a line here which denotes the Mach number at which the leading edge of the aircraft's wing becomes supersonic. And in this part of the diagram over here, lie the slender aircraft, like the Concords and the TU-144s and the Boeing SSTs, which are capable of supersonic performance. <coughs> and then beyond this curve lies an entirely different class of vehicles, which we have yet to, to see within the Earth's atmosphere, which he called the wave riders. Now, what you can see by looking at the numbers on these curves, and the numbers on those curves denote the range that can be achieved by an aircraft which is designed at any particular point in that diagram. So, for example, if I designed an aircraft which had a slenderness ratio of 0.5 and flew at a Mach number of around about uh, 0.8, I would only be able to achieve half the global range. The red curves, the swept-wing aircraft, none of those aircraft can achieve global range. Even worse, for the slender aircraft, you can see that the maximum range achievable by a slender aircraft, according to the analysis, is half the global range. And in fact, that design solution bel lies below this horizontal curve here, which is the curve of minimal allowable slenderness ratio for the purposes of having good low speed handling characteristics. <coughs> and the only part of the design space which is actually accessible to us then is this over here, where we end up with a region over here where if we design at a Mach number of about 5 to 20, we can achieve that global range using an aircraft which has decent values of slenderness ratio. And that's the wave rider. Now, the wave rider I'll skip over that slide because it's basically said what I was going to say. The wave rider is a very interesting vehicle. What it does is it generates a system of shock waves and uses those, those shock waves in a very efficient manner to generate high lift to drag values. It looks something like this. It's very simple in geometry. 
It has this attached, captured shock, and it uses that shock to generate its lift. Then it has some form of propulsive base flow, which is used to overcome the drag of the vehicle. Okay, if we look at this diagram here, this is lift to drag ratio of the wave rider versus flight Mach number. And if you go through the theory, you can end up drawing this curve over here, which shows how that lift to drag ratio varies according to Mach number. Now, if you go back to the Breguet equation, you remember lift to drag ratio, the aerodynamic efficiency is key. The problem is that if you generate a practical wave rider like vehicle and you fly it, you end up with the blue curve, or at least the blue experimental points. So what I'm trying to suggest is that the wave ride is an interesting theoretical construct, but in practice it is extremely difficult to achieve for some of the reasons shown here. First of all, external combustion is an incredibly poor mechanism for producing thrust. Aerodynamic heating precludes you from having the sharp edges which make the wave rider the most efficient. You have to have rounded leading edges. And finally, the standard wave rider analysis neglects viscous flow entirely, so underestimates the drag of the vehicle. So, okay, if we want to embody this wave rider concept in a real practical airliner, we need to do a lot of work in getting ourselves there. So, what will the future airliner look like? Let's say it's based on this wave rider concept. Well, first of all, it's worth remembering that there's an incredible gulf between paper and practice. A lot of hard work and dedication is required to bridge the gap. So, for example, in terms of the wave rider, the original theoretical construct was in 1951, and it took from 2000 all the way up to 2004 with CFD calculations, experiments, hardware debugging, until eventually the successful launch of the X-43 in achievement of Mach 9.8. Okay, so inspiration, but also I'd like to point out a lot of perspiration. And this diagram shows uh, the X-43 being manhandled out of a truck and proves uh, Edison's statement to a large degree. Okay, so what will the future airliner look like? Well, to be honest, we don't know. As I've said, we still need to do a lot of work. But perhaps there are pointers. For example, the scale composites Virgin Galactic Spaceship One. If we look back, will we see people like Richard Branson and uh, the Rutan brothers as the Wright brothers of the 21st century? Maybe we will. There's a lot of other work going on. Aircraft such as the reaction engine Skylon, which are taking a fundamentally new view at an old problem, getting away from the old concepts which have tended to constrain the design and investigating new ways of doing old things. Now, I think they are going to make s extreme progress. This is a single stage to orbit vehicle and probably not a good airliner, but there are, there are reasons to hope that the technology which has been investigated there will make a significant contribution. I think the one thing we can be sure of is that the air future airline will look radically different to anything that we know now a concept drawing in that particular case. But I'd like to argue that the aircraft might not be too different because the first thing that we need to do when we design our new airliner is to embody good airline practice within that design. So in other words, the idea of segregated fuel systems so that we end up with a crash-worthy vehicle, center of gravity management of the fuel so that we can optimize the, the range of the aircraft by shifting fuel around, an ergonomic cockpit, in other words, not some crew buried away in the bottom of some sort of robotic vehicle, so that we can have a near standard layout so pilots can actually understand what they're doing when they fly this thing. Maybe even a tube-like fuselage will be an essential so that we can have ease of evacuation, ease of handling of the aircraft on the ground. And of course, most important, maintenance and safety. In other words, independent redundant systems and in particular the propulsion system on the aircraft. And then once we start with the practicalities of an airliner like this, then we start to put on the additional technologies which, makes the, which make the, pure, the, the, the very advanced aircraft that we need in the future. So in other words, natural laminar flow, or perhaps controlled laminar part, on parts of the vehicle, active thermal protection systems, semi-autonomous control, uh, advanced cryogenic fuels, hydrogen and oxygen instead of kerosene, uh, electromagnetic control surface instead of electro, uh, 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 mechanical ones that we have at the moment, optimized aerodynamics and advanced hybrid propulsion systems. So if we have a future, we, we need to ground that future in some form of reality. And the reality is established by current airline practice in terms of what we would have to embody in an aircraft. Okay, but I make this point again. The technology is not just around the corner. There are other things that we need to do. We need the dedicated long-term planning and research into these key technological areas, some of them of which I've talked about. And dedicated hard work will be needed to bring concepts like this to fruition. So what else do we need to look at? Let me just gloss through a few of those. 
We've talked about aerodynamics. We've talked about propulsion. We've talked about thermal management. Other issues, such as aeroelastics, how do the aircraft respond uh, elastically under the loads that are applied? What is their flight dynamics like? How do you control them? What do their structures look like? How do you make those structures tolerant to damage? Not only physical damage, but thermal damage. And how do you manufacture those structures? And how do you get the materials to behave as they should? In terms of the structures, how do you integrate the systems into a vehicle like this? How do you manage the fuel dynamics? How do you contain the fuels even? And how, in, most importantly, do you maintain these vehicles and ensure reliability over the operating life of the system? Here's an example in terms of the aerodynamics. I just had to show you that picture because it's so dramatic. This is a calculation that we've done here at Strathclyde of the Skylon vehicle under highly rarefied conditions, showing the very complex shockwave structure which is generated under these rarefied flow conditions. And what we have developed here are computational methods which use, as you know, highly parallel computers that can go ahead and can actually uh, produce those simulations and allow us to understand the aerodynamics under these conditions that we wish to fly at. And the, the guy who did those calculations is sitting right here in the audience. The next thing we have to look at is how we integrate these vehicles, which are going to operate so radically differently within the air transport system. And this is a fantastic photograph because what it shows is the GPS tracks over 24 hours of aircraft entering the UK airspace system, taken from a BBC program. And what that diagram is, well, that, what that photograph is essentially showing is that Britain is crisscrossed with a system of highways, aerial highways. And the future airliner, in some fashion, needs to be integrated and work within that particular structure. So how do we do that? Well, we don't really know at the moment. There's some ideas, and the ideas are drawn largely from the space community. So, for example, if you go to Cape Kennedy, or Kennedy Space Center, what you will find is that when they want to launch spacecraft, they close down a section of airspace and allow that airspace to be used solely by spacecraft. Now, that's probably not ideal if you want to have a scheduled service from here to Sydney using high-speed aircraft every couple of hours. And the idea then is perhaps that we need to somehow expand the way that we operate the airspace by allowing an area of simultaneous operation of high-performance aircraft uh, within the terminal control area that low-performance aircraft would also be using. Okay, so that's one of the concepts. So what did we actually do, let's say in the UK context? The best, best solution, of course, is mode segregation, where if these are the existing air lanes, then what we would do is we'd have individual independent air lanes in which the high-speed aircraft would operate. Now, that's a great idea. That's the spaceport model, if you like, that you've all heard of. And it places the least constraints on the aircraft design, but it requires radical changes to the existing infrastructure, essentially a duplication and advancement of certain parts of the ground infrastructure. So if we're talking about a more sensible future perspective, then the most realistic solution is one of mode adaptation, where we change the way that our aircraft operate at certain altitudes to conform to existing practice. So we would have, for example, a high-altitude controlled airspace where these aircraft could perform to their maximum. We would then have some area of adaptation where the aircraft could adapt from the high-speed mode down into the low-speed mode and then integrate with standard flight procedures at, in the vicinity of airports. Okay, this poses additional constraints on the aircraft design, some severe additional constraints, but requires the least change to existing infrastructure and is probably the route to go forward. And it's probably the route which will, the only route which will lead to a practical embodiment of the kind of technology that I've tried to show you. All sorts of problems. How do we define holding patterns? How do we do stacking? How do we incorporate the idea that you might have to divert to another airport if the weather's bad at the other, the place where you wanted to go? How do we integrate into landing patterns? How do we avoid collisions during the transition out of the high altitude areas into the standard air lanes below. These are all things that we don't know the answers to, but we need to try to understand. What is the legal framework in which we operate these vehicles? Given that these vehicles are more like spacecraft in many ways than aircraft. Well, the problem is, of course, on the space side, there's this idea of open skies. You can fly wherever you like with a spacecraft, essentially. Whereas on the air side, there's this idea of exclusive sovereignty. Governments are allowed to define how aircraft operate within their own airspace. And somehow, these are going to be, have to be harmonized. And we're going to have to start to look at joint liability issues. What happens uh, if an aircraft crashes? What about international safety standards? How do you define those for high-performance aircraft? Transit rights, codes of conduct, and how do you actually enforce these various codes and legal issues with the system which is so radically different in concept 
to the kind of airline situation that we've been talking about so far. Other thing we have to consider is the physiological impact of travel in one of these vehicles. Passengers don't want to be astronauts, or most, probably most of them do, but uh, not when they're sipping their coffee at uh, cruising altitude. Now the problem is, of course, we don't understand very much about how humans respond in this kind of environment at all. Most of our data is ga gained on fit, healthy military humans. Airline passengers, as you know, are, represent a much wider demographic. Now, what are passenger expectations? Well, in flight, of course, they expect to be treated more or less the same as they've been treated for the last few decades. So, but the problem is, how will they respond to the different physiological conditions to which they will be exposed? To sustained accelerations, to sustained background radio, uh, rotation rates, even if those are fairly small. What about the radically different type of pressurization cycle which we will have to impose on these people? How will that affect them? We don't know. And as simple as the reaction to the view from the windows if you're sitting at 60 kilometers above the Earth's surface instead of 10. Post-flight, of course, what will happen to these people? They'll be traveling very quickly, transplanting, pla transplanting themselves around the globe in the matter of hours. What will the jet lag be like if you arrive in Sydney in two hours instead of in 20? How will you react to that? Will you still be able to perform the job that you came to do? Social impact. And this is perhaps where these aircraft stand to make the most difference. If we get it right, I believe these aircraft will bring in a new area of, era of communication. We'll shrink the planet. We'll find isolated communities. will be integrated into the world economy, places like New Zealand. Long distance travel will become like commuter travel today. Just by the existence of the technology, we'll see new markets, new ways of doing things that we don't yet fully comprehend. But if we get them these right, then we end up with a very uh, bright future indeed, ushered in by this particular technology. We need to be realistic, though. The possibility exists to get it wrong. And if we get it wrong, we cause more problems than we solve in terms of economics, in terms of waste of money and resources, and in terms of pollution. The possibility of these aircraft to produce more pollution rather than less if we don't manage the physics correctly is huge. And finally, the idea of unintended consequences, the unknown unknowns, which we don't know about at this stage, which in a way we will not find out about until the technology actually exists. Okay, so I'd like to end with a short discussion of what we are actually doing. I've talked a lot. I've made lots of uh, projections and pie-in-the-sky statements. But let's put our money where our mouth is. At Strathclyde, what we have started is a multidisciplinary research center called the Center for Future Airspace Transportation Technology. And its aim is to perform the dedicated long-term planning and research which is required to create this class of vehicles, the air transport system of the future. And what, it exists, what exists at the moment is a consortium, firstly of Strathclyde centers and individuals, other university collaborators, companies, public organizations, and individuals who all share the common aim of embodying this particular technology one day. And so, in the center, what we hope to do is to do the cutting-edge research in aerodynamics, thermodynamics, propulsion and structures, flight mechanics, the regulationary and operational aspects, the physiological issues, the environmental impact of these vehicles, the societal impact of these vehicles. And I hope that what we will form here is a basis, first of all, for vigorous intellectual activity. We need to be rigorous and vigorous, I think. A mechanism to rejuvenate UK engineering, which is stagnating. An exciting field which will engage the public. And finally, a motivation for the future youth, because these are the people who will actually use this technology one day. Now, I'd like to leave, leave things there. Thank you very much for listening to me for an hour or so. <laughs>